Welcome to another of our ongoing discussions on the Book of Mormon. Today we'll be discussing uh, the uh, mission of um, the Sons of Messiah to the Lamanites beginning in Alma chapter 17. I'm joined today by my colleagues, uh, Eric Huntsman to my immediate left and on his left, Clyde Williams and at the far end of the table, Camille Frank Olson. Welcome, thank you for being here. And my name is Paul Hoskison. Last time we concluded our discussion of Alma's mission to the people of Ammonihah. Today, as it says there, just before the chapter break uh, in chapter 17, uh, we're going to be talking about an account of the sons of Messiah who rejected their rights to the kingdom for the word of God and went up to the land of Nephi to preach to the Lamanites. This is, I, I want our audience to know that this is part of the original plates, this part uh, there at the beginning of chapter 17. But the story doesn't begin here in chapter 17. It actually begins back in Mosiah chapter 28 verse 1 when they express a desire, the sons of Mosiah, to go up to the land of, uh, of Nephi and preach to the Lamanites. Mm -hmm. And then we get this wonderful uh, flashback in Alma chapter 26 verse 23 about what that was like back in, in those days for them to go up. Can, can you imagine, just think of these young men, I mean it's remarkable, they're, they're, they're all giving up the kingdom, right, which mm -hmm. they could have had. People must have wondered about that. And, uh, and then not only they're doing this, but when they go, they're going to go among the Lamanites. This has been tried before, we know, like back in Enos, and they've not had success. And so it's all in vain. You imagine having your farewell, as it were, and here in chapter 26 and verse 23, the response they got from their fellow uh, <coughs> associates that uh, are remaining behind, they say in verse 23, uh, we said to our brethren in the land of Zarahemla, we go up to the land of Nephi to preach the, to our brethren the Lamanites. And they laughed us to scorn. <laughs> Do you suppose you could bring the Lamanites to a knowledge of the truth? Of, in essence, better to send them to the Spirit world and let it be done there. I mean, they just, I think, what a send off. And, and yet this becomes one of the most remarkable accounts. It's truly extraordinary. It, it's unusual in the, in the kind of success that they have. You just try to think of today, where would you send your uh, sons and among a people who would, the attitude would be uh, probably better to shoot one before you, you talk to them. And, and so they would consider they're going to be dead. And yet the promise made to Mosiah was that these, these young men back in chapter 28 of Mosiah be will be blessed and many will be converted. And, uh, and so they're going with faith that, uh, and their father's good wishes, even though he would be nervous like the rest of us would for our own children going into this kind of a mission. Well, it is. It, is, it seems like a type of parents today who send their children one by one on a mission not knowing beforehand the type of people they will where be they, encountering yeah. and really put their children's life in the hands of God. Well, of course, chapter 17, uh, verses 2 and 3, I mean, these are verses we use all the time as part of our missionary preparation because we uh, you've mentioned how parents feel, but what do the missionaries themselves need to do to get themselves ready? And, and we find out they're going to be such powerful missionaries because at the end of verse 2, they were men of a sound understanding. Understanding of what? Well, understanding of the gospel. They had searched the scriptures diligently. They might know the word of God, but this is not all. They had given themselves to much prayer and fasting. And the result of all this preparation is that they had the spirit of prophecy. Of course, the book of Revelation tells us that the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. They knew their Savior as well as having inspiration revelation. And the spirit of revelation, that what they taught, they had the power and authority of God. Yeah, now those verses you just read too, this is a reunion. This is what Alma, that's right, they've come back. Years, and I've thought, I sometimes say to my students now, if you see each other or you come back on campus in 14 years and you, what kind of reunion will we have? Well, hopefully we'll be glad to see each other, but even more so, the things that kept them strong and faithful were these things right here. It'll be the same for all of us. And it seems to be a mirror to what's happened with Alma, that Alma, Alma is sure. that way. And just this helps us to kind of get an idea of Alma's mission, just a quick backtrack. We know from the first four chapters of Alma that Alma had the chief judgeship as well as being the head of the church. He gave that up. And he to gave preach. that up after eight years. And so the remaining about six years, he's been on the mission 
to he's been on mission Isaac, yeah. yeah to the nephites yeah. and and ammonihah and the other there right. all the cities of the nephites so yeah. he's had his own missionary experience it is interesting that they both gave up position and influence mm -hmm. he was chief judge gave it up they were princes of the realm they gave it up yeah. you know this should encourage our young men young women and our older couples yeah sometimes you give up your grandchildren for a few years you give things up to go on a mission i i really resonate with what clyde said about how this is a reunion between alma and these sons of messiah it's not always that happy. We all know what it's like when you run into someone that you've served with, not necessarily just in the mission, but in a presidency or a bishopric or state presidency or in the Relief Society, someone that you've worked closely with, felt the spirit with, and they're not faithful anymore. Yeah. And yeah. 14 years. Yeah. yeah. That's significant. Yeah. And this leads into, of course, <clears throat> um, uh, we're going to backtrack now in time, beginning in verse 4 to go back to the time when they left Zarahemla to go up to preach to the Nephites. So this is uh, what you call a flashback. We're yeah. going to go back and pick up the story 14 years earlier and, and to find out what happens to them. And the first thing they do is to sit off in the wilderness to try and, uh, well, they're going to get food along the way. And they wind up getting uh, down to the land of, uh, uh, of um, where the Lamanites are living. And uh, in verse 12, uh, I, we don't often, uh, this doesn't always stick out, but in verse 12 it says, uh, And it came to pass that the hearts of the sons of Messiah, and also those who were with them, there, there's not four of them. Right, it's a missionary uh, team. It's a missionary team, yes. And they're going to split up now, and they're going to receive the blessing uh, uh, from their leader to go out and start the missionary work. What a, what a wonderful response. They're, they're not going as a whole group down there to, you know, to be supportive of each other. They're split up now. I think it's uh, important some of the characteristics we see here of a of a successful missionary that are uh, stated for us here. Of course in verse 9 they're fasting and praying much. I imagine if you were going somewhere that you figured they'd arrest you first before they would let you preach to them that you'd be fasting and praying and they <coughs> were. And that their really their desire was not to uh, put notches in their baptism belt. You see how many they but their desire was verse uh, nine to be an instrument in the hands of God, to be able to be used by Him to bless these people. And they have to do it in verse 11 with much patience and to be good examples. So there's... Yeah. Well, and, and I think that good examples comes through again and again and again. If we go back to see the teaching of those who are ordained to be um, with the power of God that we read in Alma chapter 13, it, there should be something by the very examples. And I think how many people have come to know the truthfulness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, not particularly from a missionary discussion, but because they were taken by the way a missionary behaves when he or she does not know that they are or being the watched. the faithful example of members whom they know. Exactly. But I think you bring up a really good point here, Clyde. Uh, to me, this, uh, these chapters here give us an outline of what a great missionary does to be a great missionary. And the, the first thing that you mention is they have a real desire to serve God, mm -hmm. not to serve man or anybody else, but to serve God. That's expressed really well when we go back to uh, Mosiah 28, yeah. verse 3, where they talk about their desire to go do this, and the verses that you read here about them wanting to do this. And, and they have to have this love and respect for the people, because I, I don't think that the sons of Messiah are, are going to go down there to, to preach to people that they, they have no respect for. They have this great love and respect for the Lamanites, their brethren, and they, they can't stand to see that these people are not, uh, are not being presented with the gospel. Uh, going on there in chapter 17, one of the other things that I think is really critical about being a good missionary uh, is express. Uh, we're going to skip a little bit, but down to verse 29 with this one. and uh, and. And now they wept because of the fear of being slain. Now we all know the story, and we're going to back up and talk a little bit about the story of how he saves the, the servants of the king. Now when Ammon saw this, his heart was swollen with joy, uh, within him with joy. For he said he, I will show forth my power unto these my servants. One of Alma's first great qualifications beside his desire is he, he wants to try and win people over. He wants to, to serve them honestly. And in the beginning when he's offered the king's daughter, no, that's not what he's about on his mission. He's, he's about serving the people in any way that he can. And so he starts off in the servant position there. And then we get the marvelous story. Let's talk about that. Well, I, I just think that, that as you follow through that story, mm -hmm. it's not going to be a surprise that the people start wondering if this is some divine person who is there. Notice that he first says he wants to be a servant. And what right. servant is he? He's a shepherd. He he yeah. wants he watches over the flocks. There's beautiful symbolism here, isn't yeah. there? Let's. I mean, this is a very 
familiar story, but let's get this set up. He's alone. He's in the land of Ishmael, and he's gone into the realm of kind of a junior king, King Lamoni, and that's when he wants to be a servant. When, when he could have the glory right, right. there, mm -hmm. but he said, no, it's like descending below and becoming first a servant and, and then one who watches the flocks. And the very first thing that happens as they're watching the flocks, the, the sheep are scattered right. and there's panic. And I love verse 31, and it came to pass that he flattered them with his words saying, my brethren, be of good cheer and let us go in search of the flocks. Be of good cheer. That's that's quintessential Jesus Christ language. When things seem to be the darkest, he says, be of good, good cheer. cheer. And he teaches them to gather Go out the and sheep. find the lost sheep. Go find. He sends them out to gather, to find the lost sheep. And in verse 33, he says, I will go and contend with these men. Isn't that the Savior? Well, he gives us the assignment to gather the sheep, and he will go fight the battles. He fights our battles for he us. He will go do that. And so he, he fights the battles in such a way that they come back in chapter 18, verse 3, and to the conclusion to King Lamoni and say, we do not believe that a man has such great power, for we know he cannot be slain. There's a type of Christ. Right. I, I think it's significant in what Ammon is doing here, too, as he goes forward. And we see in verse 29, his heart was <laughs> swollen within him with joy when he saw that these servants were fearful. He, see, he realizes this is my opportunity. They don't feel self-sufficient. They recognize the need. They don't know what to do. They're fear, fearing for their lives. Here's the chance for the Lord to use me, to magnify me before them so that we can begin to open the door. And yeah, they so realize they are lost. There is no hope for them. Yeah. They're at the very bottom. Well, they are dead because yeah. the sheep are scattered. Yeah, and the king yes. we know has been doing that. And so when he goes, and then of course when he's uh, warding off all of these uh, these uh, uh, men who were robbers, uh, who are murderers and also because they know the king's servants are being slain when they steal these sheep. Uh, and Ammon can't be harmed and can't be hurt. It, it's remarkable in terms of the, <laughs> the manner in which he stands forth and, and yet doesn't, he just, he's on his way. And the next thing we find, he's watering the king's horses. He just, he's not making a big thing it's about it. It's interesting that he uses a sling to, to yeah. ward off these men and because that connects it with the image of the youthful King David, who of course was a Christ type. And you've talked about yeah. Jesus fighting our battles for us. And uh, uh, as you mentioned there in verse, uh, uh, chapter 18, verse 10, uh, he's already come back and the report's <laughs> already been given to the king, but yeah. where's Ammon? He's not there boasting of what he's done. Yeah. He's just obeying another he's of the commandments. He's just being a faithful yeah. servant. Yeah. And I think I want to emphasize the word here, faithfulness of Ammon there in the middle of verse 10. Yeah. A very faithful. faithful servant. Because he remembered all of my commandments to execute them. Yes. Isn't that what we covenant to do with the sacrament is to remember him and to keep his commandments. Uh, perhaps another good reason why we encourage missionaries today to, uh, to be involved in service along with what they're doing as missionaries because really this is a key to, to uh, demonstrating Christ-like character but also helps to open hearts of people as well. Let's set the stage now for, for the conversion of Lamoni and his people. I want to back up a little bit in chapter 18, go back to verse 2 and pick up some of the traditions of the Lamanites uh, near the end of verse 2. Surely this is more than a man. Behold, is not this the great spirit who doth send such great punishments upon this people because of their murders? So it's clear the Lamanites have a tradition of, of a great spirit. Some kind of divine power. Some kind of divine power, yes. It's mentioned again down there in verse 5. Now this was the tradition of Lamoni which he had received from his father that there was a great spirit mm -hmm. notwithstanding what did they believe yeah, yeah. read this yes. notwithstanding they believed in a great spirit they supposed that whatsoever they did was right mm -hmm. so they have this concept of, of some kind of divine being but that the, that doesn't really matter as far as what's right and wrong no goes no consequence no consequences mm -hmm. for it yes and that's going to play a big part now when we get into uh, the actual conversion of Lamoni, these traditions. But look at that, Lamoni began to fear exceedingly with fear lest he had done wrong in slaying his servants. I think that seems to suggest light either something light of Christ, light of Christ with, yeah, or even maybe the influence of the Holy Ghost right. because this is going to direct him now to, to true conversion. Well, Ammon's spiritual powers uh, 
are yeah. leading him to that in verse 16. This has always been such an amazing scene. I actually go back to verse 14. Ammon is called in to talk to the king when he's been out feeding the horses and he comes in and the king doesn't even know how to begin this discussion. And students love this. They sit there staring at each other for about an hour according to Lamanite time. And finally, Ammon is filled with the Spirit of God and can perceive what the king is thinking, which is very interesting since in Alma 12:3. Alma told Zeezrom, only God can understand the thoughts of our hearts. And so he says, oh, you're concerned because you think I am this great spirit, etc. Uh, and when, when Moni finally asks Ammon that, are you this great spirit, this divine power we sense is out there somewhere, Ammon says, I am not. Which that is significant because there is only one I am, and right, that is yes. Jesus now, Christ. Jesus will say, I am, or I am he. Mm -hmm. and, and Ammon says, I am not this great spirit. But what he needs to do now is maneuver the king into asking about this great spirit. I think uh, I like 16 uh, for another reason here, verse, uh, verse 16 there, and that is that uh, he is a servant now. He's put himself in the place of a servant. It's not the, the place of a servant to speak first. Mm -hmm. And so he's hesitating for an hour and nothing happens. The king, he's hesitating because he, the king now thinks he's in a subservient position. Mm -hmm. They both think they're in a subservient position and it's only the spirit of the Lord that breaks that impasse. And Alma is brave enough in spite of the position he's put himself in Ammon. as the servant, Ammon, uh, uh, in the uh, position he's in, to break that impasse because the spirit says, here's what the king's thinking about. And that's one of the qualities I think of a great missionary is to listen to the spirit to tell you what to do in these kind of situations. Well, and that's finally what gets the teaching opportunity rolling because finally mm -hmm. the king says, I will do anything to find out what you know. And Ammon being wise but harmless, I love that pair of terms, says, will you listen to what I have to say? He says, yes, I will listen to what you have to say. And thus was Lamoni, the king, caught with guile. Now clearly this can't be the kind of guile which is seen as a bad thing and which Nathaniel and John is good for not having. This must be it in the broader sense of artifice or cunning. Uh, Ammon's thought this through or the spirits helped him know this is the way we've got to approach this situation. Well, it's, it's used the same way here in the Book of Mormon as Paul uses it in 2 Corinthians 12, 16, where Paul says, uh, but be it so, I did not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you with guile. That is, I, I was able to preach the gospel to you because I had a strategy yeah. to yeah. come across to my you. Plan to do that. It was my Dis plan to do it. Disarm them from all of their reasons for not right. listening. But once the Moni is ready to listen, suddenly Ammon speaks with boldness in verse 24. So he's yeah. been as a servant, he's, he's waited, he's, he's looked for this opportunity, and then he's ready to teach. I think we need to point out here that there are some characteristics of people who are ready to receive the gospel also, and Lamoni exemplifies those. So we have, we have the pattern of the, of the great missionary, we have the pattern of the great convert. And the first qualification, as you mentioned there is, uh, in, uh, at least in, um, there in chapter 18, is that he's willing to listen. Mm -hmm. The king is willing to listen now. And that, if, you, if you never get to that stage, you can't make a convert. Now when this teaching dialogue begins, this is always a little confusing sometimes for Latter-day Saints with our understanding of the nature of God. Ammon says the king, believest thou that there's a great spirit? And we've already seen clues in the text that he did believe in a great spirit. And Lamoni says, yea. And Ammon said, this is God. And then goes on to explain that he created everything, etc. Now, of course, we believe that God is an exalted person, that He is glorious, but that He's physical. Um, how do you approach this, that Ammon seems to be satisfied with saying, yeah, God is a great spirit? Well, I think we can go into so much detail right to begin with and unpackage. <laughs> There's what he knows about the great spirit is a great place to start with, and he's going to build on that and help him to understand Jesus Christ if this, this, we look at Jesus Christ as the great spirit, you could even say at that particular time, he is a spirit. Right, because he's the God of the Old Testament, the God of the Book of Mormon. He has not yet taken upon flesh. The great Jehovah is a great spirit at this time. Right. Yeah. He doesn't have a physical body. And so this tradition of the Lamanites is not far from correct yeah. that's right. in well, here. And, and that's then, why Ammon can say that. Right, right. And then, of course, he's now going to go through and we're going to teach the basics of the creation, the fall, and the atonement uh, or redemption over here in verse 39 just the fundamental things that one needs to, if you don't understand that 
the order and the importance of the creation, the fall, and the plan of redemption, everything else is going to be right. off base. Ever since Second Nephi 2, Father Lehi, we see this consistently with Book of Mormon prophets. You teach the atonement in the context of the full plan. Yeah. Creation, fall, redemption, resurrection, judgment. So many more judgment. questions are answered. So many yes. more things are clear when you understand. If you don't, then, then things just don't come together for people. So it's, yeah. it's a great example for us. Uh, this is a, a great lesson about what you teach in all dispensations in all places, That's all right. missionaries. You teach the plan of salvation. Uh, as it says in Alma 12:15, uh, you, uh, God gave them commandments after He had given them the plan right. of salvation. Because yeah. the commandments don't make much sense unless they're put in the context yeah. of the three acts well, of this play that we're in. Right. And, and, and the, in some ways, the atonement is limited in how much power it has until we really understand what has happened to us because of the fall. Yeah. Yes. I want to point out too, uh, uh, Clyde, you bracketed this, but uh, in verse uh, 37, one of the other things that we always teach in all dispensations and places is the history of God's people. Yeah. And that's and the title page purpose of the Book of Mormon, what it, great it, things God has done for our fathers. Yeah. Uh, and here he begins a course with Father Lehi to give them the history of what's led up to them at that particular right. time. Mm -hmm. Our missionaries today, you begin teaching the history of God's people with Joseph Smith yeah. and bringing them from Joseph Smith up to the contemporary scene. Yes. So these are the two things that are always brought out in, in, in all gospel dispensations, the plan of salvation and the history of God's people. Well, and this is the response every missionary is hoping for. After he hears it, <laughs> verse 41, he began to cry unto the Lord, saying, O Lord, have mercy according to thy abundant mercy which thou hast had upon the people yeah. of Nephi. Have it on me and my people. People. Now, what you yeah. don't want to happen in your discussion is have the person fall down as if dead. But of course, we know this is kind of a pattern in the Book of Mormon. There seems to be some kind of typology here. Well, maybe if we were dealing with people that had been as far steeped in these false traditions and as and as far away from the truth as they had been, that, that this kind of a remarkable, this really remarkable thing happens because they're coming from... Of course, it happened to Alma the Younger as well. I mean, yeah. it seems And the four sons of Mosiah were there as witnesses there seems of that. to be yes. something. It shows that these people have been spiritually dead up to this point, whether they're people who have left the truth like Alma the Younger, yeah. people who have never been near right, it, right, right. and they fall down as if dead because spiritually they have been dead. Is this a type and shadow of a baptism where you bury the old Romans dead 6, person? Romans 6, 4, the old man or yeah. woman of Christ is buried yeah, and then rises yeah. with yeah. new life. Very Isn't good. it interesting, in fact, since you've talked about that, yeah. it's in the beginning of verse 19, everyone's upset that the, that the king seems to have died. After two days and two nights, they were about to put the body in the sepulcher, which means it's on the third day. Yes, yeah. and, and on the morrow, verse 8 yeah. says, yeah. So they're going to wait for three days. And there's yeah. another type. Um, and it's remarkable here to me, we've got this little Lamanitish uh, uh, woman, Abish, and uh, who I, I sometimes, she's a closet member of the church. Uh, she's had to keep this quiet, been converted, uh, as it says here, through the remarkable vision of her father. And so she's known, and now her desire is to want to have others feel and, and know what she know is, knows is true. And, and then we get quite a dichotomy of responses here. We get some of those who were at the waters of Sebus when right. Ammon was slaying those wicked men who see a chance to kill Ammon, who has also collapsed. Well, let's, let's bring up uh, the conversion of Lamoni's wife first here in, in verse 10, uh, where she comes in and says, you know, Ammon, I've heard that you're, you're a great prophet. Um, come and look at my, my husband and let's talk about this because they want to bury him and I don't, mm -hmm. I don't want right, to bury right, him. Yeah. <coughs> and he, he doesn't he, stink to me. <laughs> no, no. I wonder how many wives think of that of their husbands. I hope all of them do. Um, and vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> and he asks her in verse 9, believest thou this? And she basically says, yes, I do. And, and then what, this and remarkable she, what is that statement. Based on? She yeah. the same willingness to believe that Lamona had. Yes. I'll believe all your words. And, and she's heard it from her servants, yeah. second mm -hmm. hand. Well, yes. and of course, then Ammon raises Lamoni, who, who bears his testimony. But look at verse 13. He says, I have seen my Redeemer, and he shall come forth and be born of woman. That actually goes back to the great spirit part. Yes. Because this great spirit is not just the premortal Jehovah. I know that by being born of woman, he's going to become the man Jesus. So his understanding of who his Lord is, is no longer just a great spirit, not even the premortal Jehovah. Mm -hmm. It is Jesus Christ. Yes. in the flesh, who will suffer and die and then rise. So somehow he's really been taught during this period of well, being let's, passed let's talk about out. Abish. Can we for a second again? Sure. Yeah. Uh, here she is, a Lamanitish woman, and she's been converted unto the Lord for many years. This is in verse 16, on account of a remarkable vision of her father. We don't know whether she had the vision of her father or her father had, had a, vision. a vision. But anyway, she, she's converted. I, I wonder how many people in the history of the world are there 
who through some remarkable circumstance have come to a knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ and we never hear about them. Yeah. Or we it may not be them. as remarkable, it may be small little miracles in their lives have prepared them. I mean, I think that's what's significant. In every mission field, the Lord has been preparing people. Well, mm -hmm. yes. And isn't there something here as far as another um, aspect of missionary work? There are those on the other side of the veil who are participating as well. And we don't know how much help yes. we get from, from others. I have a quote here from Elder Melvin J. Ballard. Why is it that sometimes only one of a city or a household receive the gospel? That's Abish, right? Mm -hmm. It has been made known unto me that it is because of the righteous dead who had received the gospel in the spirit world, exercising themselves. And in answer to their prayers, elders of the church were sent to the homes of their posterity, that the gospel might be taught to them and through their righteousness, they might be privileged to have a descendant in the flesh, do the work for their kindred dead. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder how much that is going on every day. Every day, all the time. And women are really involved in this, in this aspect of the gospel. And with that, we have about a minute left, Camille. I wonder if you oh. can sum up our discussion here today, uh, covering Alma chapters 17 through, oh, we didn't quite get to 20, but it'll do. Well, this, this is one of our favorite, I mean, it's a remarkable part of the Book of Mormon with a story that inspires all of us to desire lifelong missionary duties that a year and a half or two years is not what we're talking about, but this is being a lifetime missionary and the way these four sons of Mosiah and their companions inspire us, but also members like Abish and Lamoni and his queen. The fact that it's not giving recognition to them, but in every single case, they bear testimony of Jesus Christ. The first words out of Lamoni's mouth, the first words as Lamoni's queen and he are raised up again are to, to praise Jesus Christ as their redeemer. These, these missionaries become types of Christ as they suffer and are willing to give their very lives, but to be servants, true servants, that their examples bear witness that they really do believe this. That's, that, to me, that message and an entire people, that all of Lamoni's people make that tremendous change and it doesn't have to take a lot of time. Thank you, Camille. This introduces the, this people of great faith and we'll continue discussing these people of great faith in our next discussions. Thank you, it's been a pleasure being with you.